Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Wednesday, February 20th, 2019 Market Watchers Live Show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swenlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Well, another day, another move higher in the market. We got the Dow Jones Industrial Average currently up 30 points, the S&P 500 up five, the NASDAQ up 19, the Russell 2000 up another six and a half. Ten-year Treasury yield after being lower earlier today has rebounded a bit, up about a half a basis point, 2.65%. Trying to hold on to the recent lows, though, which is very important in the near term. Volatility continues to drift lower. Look at it down more than 4% today to 14 0.22%, well below lows that we have seen established during prior bear markets. I think this is that's a bullish sign for the market. Materials continuing to push higher here. Uh, really seen some leadership from materials the last few days. The dollar index has been struggling, and that's at least partially the reason, in my opinion. A couple of areas of the market looking pretty good. I mentioned the uh, hotels group, I don't know, a week, a couple weeks ago, uh, that they looked like they were starting to strengthen. You can see that this uh, this leadership from this group continues. I looked back and it is the strongest industry group in the consumer discretionary area over the last 30 days. So that is uh, significant, starting to show some real strength in a key area of the market. Uh, here you can see the hotels and REIT, or hotels REIT, um, which also is doing well. This is uh, somewhat interesting because real estate group together, you know, overall today is the worst performing sector. But this was the one area of the REITs that is performing well and kind of relates a little bit back to the hotels that I was just talking about. Garmin came out with a very, very solid earnings. We'll take a look at their uh, longer term chart in just a bit. But you can see up $11 today, about 15 percent. Huge move today with its earnings. CVS, the other end of the spectrum, uh, gapping down, missed on its earnings. Uh, not very good report. And then uh, the worst of the, uh, the bunch, these last three, I could call the good, the bad, and the ugly because Wix was ugly. I don't like these companies when you get these huge moves up into earnings. Uh, they did beat top and bottom line, but they warned. Obviously, they were not giving that message to Wall Street before they reported. And so I have a feeling this one could be under pressure for a while. But WIX really getting hit hard today, down about 13% on the day. All right, Aaron, one thing I'm noticing about the market is that as the volatility drops and we're now down to 14 and change, we're seeing less and less of these swings in the market. It's starting to get very boring. I mean, you know, <laughs> big moves in the market, but you know, now today the Dow up 30. Um, you know, I was going to write in my blog this morning that we had a big reversal yesterday and we did, but on the Dow it was 70 points in the last hour. It really wasn't that big. Dow. But, like it yeah it's i mean it, it's just slow going at this point uh you know isn't the fed coming up with some uh notes here minute, minutes soon i mean i suspect maybe people are just on their you know waiting on their heels to see what's going to happen with that but at the same time those that's usually baked in so i don't know <laughs> well there are some very interesting I, I mean i can still see those who are on the bearish side i've kind of converted back over to the bullish side because my long-term picture is bullish mm -hmm. and i know arthur hill wrote a, a don't ignore this chart blog article uh, i think it was this morning and he made mention of the fact that when he's looking at a stock he looks at the big picture trend and then tries to figure out everything else shorter term and i do that with the market as well and so my market long-term picture is bullish so Yes, you can have cyclical bear markets in the you know secular bull, and I think that's what we just had. But there are some interesting things going on in the market right now that I wrote about in my blog with the weekly PPO getting close to the center line that never went through the center line the last two bear markets. Uh, it's already gone across the center line, by the way, on the Dow Jones, but hmm. the others have not. They're getting close. And then the other thing that's interesting is Usually when you're in a downtrend and in a bear market, we never see the weekly RSIs get above 60. And those are also getting very close. So I think the bears have some ammunition here, but they better start firing. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, one of the things, too, that I'm I mean, for me, I got back in a bit into the market toes in. You know, I, I feel like you've got, even with the defensive sectors, you know, they're being carried up. I, if you look at how they're doing, they're not doing as well as some of the more aggressive sectors right now. But I think, you know, even when the market starts to head back down, which I think it will do, you know, there's still going to be places that are going to be doing okay. 
And uh, so I'm still I'm still leaning into the defensive sectors. I'm, at least I'm not fully in cash anymore. So that can give you an idea of how I'm feeling about the market. Yeah, I think defensive makes sense too. I did uh, another one that I think we'll talk about later during what would you do is Kimberly Clark, which is in that defensive area and it's moving up and trying to make a breakout and so forth. So there's definitely an argument to be made for some of the defensive stocks. We're going to get into a lot of stuff here. Why don't we uh, go through the upcoming schedule and agenda? Oh, yes. Let's get going. We've got lots of good stuff to talk about. All right. For this week coming up, we have uh, tomorrow, we're going to have Julius DeKempener, our Mr. RRG here. What's hot, what's not with Mary Ellen McGonigal will be Friday. Tim Ord, fellow market timer of me uh, that I, I, uh, I follow is uh, Tim Ord of the Ord Oracle. You might see him in the uh, top advisors corner. And then Tom's going to give us the March seasonality report on the final day of the month. But what are we going to do today? Well, we're going to start off with trading day preparation. Um, Tom and I are going to go over what we like to do beforehand, uh, before the day starts. So we'll go through kind of our daily prep. And 10 and 10, our very first uh, better, very first symbol will be next era energy, ni. <laughs> what would you do will be our final segment. So stick around, lots to talk about, and let's get started, Tom, with technical news and headlines. All right. Uh, well, first, let's just jump right into there was no economic uh, news of significance today. So I'm just going to jump right in and take a look at the 10 year Treasury yield, which should be up on your screen here. Uh, this is what I was referring to over the past couple of weeks, two to three weeks. You can see we've been bottoming out around 2.63 percent. So the bullish argument is that we're hitting support and bouncing off of it. The bearish argument is that you're still very close to these January lows from the huge drop that we made back in November. And this definitely does not bode well, in my opinion, for the economy. For you know, if you're looking forward and you're thinking, okay, the economy is going to strengthen, it's going to continue to grow. Well, that's not what the 10-year Treasury yield is telling us. So this is probably the biggest question mark that I have in my mind right now about the equity markets going higher. Is why isn't the 10-year Treasury yield following suit? And you'd mentioned earlier, Aaron, the FOMC minutes they come out this afternoon. We'll see what, how the Treasury market responds to that at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, a, a breakout above the, this 20-day moving average would be bullish. Otherwise, as long as it remains in this downtrend, you have to at least keep one finger on the sell button for U.S. equities. So I think this is still something to keep an eye on. As far as earnings go, we had a bunch of earnings, and they just continue to pour in. Second-tier comp companies for the most part, but there are a lot of uh, uh, earnings to discuss. So first, let's start off with uh, Concho Resources. You can see the whole list there. There were some disappointments here, but there were also some really good beats. Cadence Design had another su superior report. Uh, that's a company that reported some solid re results uh, three months ago. They did it again. Uh, Garmin, huge, huge uh, numbers there. Garmin is now one of the top scooters among the large cap stocks. Um, but uh, let's jump in and take a look at some of what the charts are telling us on these various companies. I'm going to start with Garmin. All right, so here you can see pretty clear positive reaction, I would say, to Garmin's report. Look at the, the re or excuse me, the volume already. Five million shares have traded. We're not even the halfway point of the day, and that already swamps anything we've seen over the last six months. And I'm just going to stretch this out to a couple of years so that we can get a good sense of the volume that is pouring into this stock right now. Five million shares today, and if you look back, there's only been one one time in the last two years that we've had over six million shares, and that was literally two years ago. And we're going to swamp that today. We're probably looking at you know nine, ten million shares, perhaps. And with this kind of a candle, hollow candle, if you think about when a stock gaps up, you've got market makers providing liquidity, so they're always taking the op opposite side of a trade when there's an imbalance in volume. Well, they were shorting at the open and the market kept going higher. That should tell you about the demand that is in for, you know, in the stock right now. So Garmin having an absolutely spectacular day. This is a stock, no doubt, that will go on my strong earnings chart list. I'm not going to chase it up here, but it's one that if we were to pull back to today's open somewhere down the road, mid 70s, you know, 76 ish, that area, I think that Garmin would be very attractive on a pullback down the road. 
Um, let's look at a couple of others. Uh, start off with CXO. Now, CXO, Concho Resources, you can see the gap down. This is, again, a two-year chart. This is a company that, was, that got hit very hard, lost 50% of its value, close to 50, maybe 45% of its value in the fourth quarter. Had a nice recovery, but recently, as the market keeps going higher, you can see CXO is going lower, and now with earnings gapping down big volume today, they missed top line, they missed bottom line, so not looking good here. Technically, a break below 110 to the downside would be very bearish on CXO. Verisk Analytics, VRSK. Now, they uh, missed on their bottom line, buck four versus a buck six, but they did beat barely on the top line. Revenues were 613.9 million versus 613.1 million. They also initiated a 25 cent dividend. I didn't read about it, but I'm assuming this will be a quarterly dividend going forward. Uh, the pullback today has been somewhat orderly. Yes, it's down two and a quarter percent, but a rising 20 day test is nothing really to get overly alarmed about. And what I'm seeing here on the chart is a move up really like a cup. And I think the earnings report down to the 20 day moving average could be your handle. Uh, now, I know it's not a rounded cup, so I'd prefer something that was a little bit more rounded. But nonetheless, you got a top, a pullback, another top. Maybe if it breaks that 20 day and comes down, maybe we'll see a longer term ascending triangle start to form. But I'd, I'd watch that 20 day. I think that's an area where the stock could turn. Um, now, CDNS, by the way, I didn't give you the numbers, but they beat on their top line 569.9 million uh, versus 550.2. And you can see uh, the big gap up. It has come down a little bit from its earlier high, uh, but they beat top line, bottom line, and they guided everything higher. Their next quarter's revenues and earnings per share and fiscal year 19 revenues and earnings per share, all of it guided higher. But the stock was already building a lot of that in. And this is, I hope, one thing that you get from Market Watchers Live and some of the things we talk about. Technical analysis is already pricing in fundamental news. So this is a company that broke out back at the beginning of February, taking out all these prior tops. So it was telling us that we were going to see a solid report and you can see what happened to Cadence Design the last time they reported earnings back in October. Huge move up to the upside. So I think uh, CDNS looks good. But uh, this is another one that I would put on my strong earnings chart list and wait for a pullback. CVS. CVS uh, beat top line, beat bottom line, but they guided their fiscal, 19, fiscal year 19 earnings per share lower. A lot of it, I think, already built in. I like the hollow candle. I think maybe we've got already all the sellers out of the stock. Potentially, uh, I would change my mind if we close below 62. But barring that, I would suspect that CVS goes higher from here. Southern Company SO beat top line, beat bottom line, stock breaking out above its two year highs. So Southern Company looking pretty good. Analog devices, ADI, this is in the semiconductor space. They did beat on their top line in terms of revenues. They beat bottom line earnings per share. Once again, this is a company that had already broken out telling us that we should be expecting some pretty good news. They raised their dividend. They did guide in line. So if there was one negative, we didn't see raised guidance here. But overall, I think the chart looks good. Wix. Now, W-I-X, this is uh, Wix.com. This is the one I think you got to be careful of. If I was in this, I would be a seller. Anytime a company is trading at an all-time high, or at least a two-year high, and doing so, heading into an earnings report that beats, but then they lower their guidance going forward, to me, that tells me they did not communicate this to Wall Street. Wall Street did not see this coming. We know what happened to Facebook back when they came out with their you know, bad news. They were trading at an all-time high and then dropped a bomb on Wall Street. I think we got to be careful here with WIX on this gap down. I suspect this is not the end of the selling here. I think you're going to see more selling. I wouldn't be surprised down the road a few months. I wouldn't be shocked to see it back down here around this AD level to test the uh, December lows. All right, I want to just point out one last thing before we go over upgrades and downgrades, um, and that is on this daily chart on the S&P, you can see the overhead price resistance. This is why I was saying early in the show, I think the bears, if they've got their ammunition, ammunition ready, they better start firing because we are getting close to some very critical overhead price resistance. And if we go into the weekly chart, you will see that this PPO, the weekly PPO, is approaching the center line. It never went above the center line in the last two bear markets. That tells you that positive momentum, you don't normally see positive momentum 
in a bear market. So it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I think this isn't just any old line on the chart. I think if it goes above the zero line, it's pretty much telling us that the bear market's dead. Uh, my opinion, of course. All right. And oh, by the way, there's your weekly RSI, which is now at 56. And again, last two bear markets never went above 60. So getting close to some key levels, Aaron. And uh, I don't know. I know, you know, you're still somewhat bearish and I, I understand it. And I, I, I can see why, especially with overhead price resistance. But if we take these levels out, I don't know. Looks starting to look a little more bullish to me. Oh, well, I think everything's looking in the short term a lot more bullish, but I'm I'm still thinking intermediate to longer term, it, it ain't over. <laughs> so right now, yeah, we're getting ready to have some interesting resistance. You know, if we beat all time highs, uh, I I certainly will <laughs> have to reevaluate whether we're going to see a, a continuation. Right now, it's starting to look pretty good, but I my uh, indicators are still pretty ugly on the monthly chart. So have to hold off with that. All right, well, uh, we do have some upgrades and downgrades. Let's go ahead and take a peek. Actually, it was very interesting. There were about like six upgrades. There just really weren't that many today. Uh, so we're gonna look at only one of them at this point. Uh, Ocean Oceaneering International was upgraded today. And what I noticed about this particular chart is of course we had that bull kiss is what I call it, came down, the PMO came down, kissed that signal line, and then headed back up. Uh, so I like to see that because that usually indicates we're going to see more upside. We did get a breakout here. Upside potential is a problem for me, though, on this one. Uh, you know, obviously, if you can get two and a half percent out of a 41 cent move, uh, you certainly could still, you know, pull in some, uh, a decent, um, you can still come out decently with your with your pick. So I noticed though that you could see the overhead resistance really lines up with these November tops with the October low. And then back here, you can see the trading range that was going on at uh, near the beginning of 2018. And that's really where we're sitting in this lower trading range. And next up, I would say is this trading range. Uh, we did get the, the upgrade. So you know, I think we could make it up to that $18 level. Uh, after that, watch the PMO. I suspect it'll be looking pretty good and it's not at all overbought just yet. So this one might be good for your watch list. Let's look at some downgrades though. And like I said, there were just a ton of them today. All right, downgraded today was Southwest Airlines. Clearly uh, not uh, good news for the company and, and investors are not really happy about that either. You know, we were in this trading range and you can see that the PMO had already started to turn over. We didn't have the sell signal yet. We got that today, but we already were getting warning here when we had a PMO in pretty much overbought textbook territory where you have a four to minus four range on the PMO. It hit the top of the range, started to turn over. Uh, that would have been the warning. You could have also seen, look at the scooter and what it did. Uh, you know, again, warning, lots of warning signs, even the OBV uh, declining tops and price tops were about even. So these are the kind of things you want to look for on your charts uh, the, you know, of the of the symbols and the, the investments you have. Those are the kind of things you wanna look for to give you an idea of what, what's gonna happen, obviously. Uh, so what I'm looking at now, uh, Palo Alto Networks, this one was also downgraded today. Uh, I see that we had a reverse head and shoulders that had set up off of this very large decline that started in September for Palo Alto Networks. But the the reverse head and shoulders came into play. We actually got a buy signal here all the way back at the end of November. Of course, if you had hung out, hang on uh, with that buy signal, you've had would have had to take this uh, loss that we had back here when the right shoulder started to form. Uh, but once it started to rise again, we did get that breakout above that neckline. And if you look at uh, the actual measurement here. Uh, you could see a measured move all the way up to the all-time high here. So I, I would look for that. I think that Palo Alto Network still looks pretty good. But as you can see, that PMO is starting to turn over despite price moving upward. So if you're holding this, um, keep an eye on it. 
All right, Charles Schwab, I know E-Trade, a couple of these, uh, let's see, TD Ameritrade, these were all downgraded today. Uh, I think that of all of them though, I think Schwab has some opportunity. Uh, and that is because I'm seeing another reverse head and shoulders off of a, a pretty long decline in the trading range, really. If we can get that breakout, it could be very interesting. The problem is right now, of course, is you have a PMO and currently with the market action we've got, you've got it turning down under the signal line. All right, two more real quick. Service Master was also downgraded today. It's hit overhead resistance and is moving right back down. Tested uh, and actually is testing the 200 day EMA. PMO has turned over. It was already slowing. Uh, I would be looking for more downside for Service Master. And finally, Trex. Trex was also downgraded today. And you can see that the PMO is turning down. Uh, it was confirming this rally. And I'm not so sure that it isn't over yet. Uh, but we did hit some pretty interesting resistance here at $80 that you know formed resistance back here in August. Uh, and was a spot where we got a little bit of consolidation back in September. We hit it, we've turned back down. You know, I, I wouldn't be getting into something like this if I were holding it, I would probably be looking to sell it. Uh, but the PMO isn't completely overbought, so there's certainly uh, some upside that you could look for. OBV doesn't look that negative, uh, but overall, I certainly wouldn't be looking to get into this. Maybe on a watch list, you know, follow it back down to the $70 range, see what's going to happen. And that's all I have for upgrades and downgrades. We certainly had uh, quite a few, like I said, downgrades. I will have this chart up for you in the Market Watchers Live recap. That way, I don't have to read it to you right now. <laughs> All right, Tom, why don't we go ahead and get started with our daily trading prep? What do we do every day? I mean, we take uh, obviously a different approach for those who are unfamiliar with Market Watchers Live. Aaron takes a little bit more of a longer term approach and I'm more of a short term trader. So I thought maybe we would go through and highlight some of the things we uh, we do on a regular basis uh, to kind of further our uh, investing slash trading. So. Yes. Go first, Aaron. All right. So for me, my trading day actually begins the afternoon before the trading day. And the reason that is, is because my indicators, the decision point indicators, don't uh, update until about 15 minutes after the close. And so I start there because I want to look at what my uh, close of business indicators are doing. And so I, and I know Tom's going to talk about setting up your dashboard. I would go straight into the decision point live chart list and you can get to this chart list as well. And I'm going to show you how, uh, just go to, uh, the articles, click on decision point, And right there is my live chart list. So this is where I would start in the afternoon. I look at obviously what's going on with all of the, DP um, uh, scoreboard indexes, which of course is the Dow, S&P 500, 100, and then the NASDAQ 100. And so I would review all of those charts as well. But I save that part usually for the following morning. The afternoon, I have to look for a few things and one would be my indicators. So um, you can arrow down all the way down to the indicators. And of course, there's a lot to cover here because I do have all of those uh, monthly and daily charts. So I'm gonna just click in here so I can get there more easily. So as you can see, de decision point live chart list. And so all of those that I just showed you uh, from Aaron's live chart list, that's all of the charts that are in there. And I do try to keep them annotated uh, at least twice weekly, if not daily. So first close of business indicators are the ultra short term indicators. And that would be the VIX, which does uh, come in during the day. Uh, but the breadth numbers, as you can see, they haven't updated since yesterday. And so that's where I go to look at what's happened to the VIX and compare all of the um, signals and you know what I'm seeing here. And I look for, on this particular chart, I'm looking for climactic readings. So 
you know, we had some climactic readings back here on, that was yesterday, so that was Tuesday. We didn't have Monday, so on Friday, we did get some very climactic readings to the upside. And we did see that the VIX was not quite to the upper Bollinger Band. And so what that was really telling us, and Carl and I both agreed, that was an initiation, a buying initiation. So that tells me the next day, in this case, Tuesday, to start looking for upside uh, over the next day or two. This is a very, very short term chart. And that's what I look for there. So I need to look at this the night before, the afternoon before, because you know, I want to know what to expect on the open and possibly uh, the open on the following day after that. Short term indicators, again, these don't go final until the afternoon. So I'm doing my daily prep uh, starting in the afternoon. And, you know, the short term indicators, they tell me what to expect in the shorter term. I've been watching negative divergences going on here, uh, which is another reason why I continued, <laughs> I've continued to expect more downside. But as you can see, these indicators as of last night, were starting to break out. Uh, I'll be writing about all these indicators in the decision point, uh, the DP alert uh, tonight. So you can hear me really go over them uh, at that point in my blog. So I'm not going to get too crazy about uh, that. So the other indicator would be the intermediate term um, indicators of the breadth mom momentum and volume momentum oscillators. Uh, as you can see right now, very overbought, but they have turned up. And then some of the other indicators I might look at as well are the ones that you might find in the DP chart gallery. Uh, I have them, of course, in my own chart list, but I'm, I'm going to show it to you so you can figure out how to get there. If you just go to the charts and tools page, it's actually a lot easier to find on the right hand side, additional tools and reports, decision point chart gallery. All right. And so I have to look and see if we had any signal changes so that I can update uh, the scoreboards. And of course, trend model signals are all on the daily chart. PMO signals are on the weekly chart. So that's why I'm going to get into in a little bit. But condition charts uh, and breadth charts, these are all some of the ones that I do look at uh, in the afternoons. Typically, some of these bigger picture indicators, though, I do look at uh, more on a weekly basis. All right, so I check for my signal changes. And then the following morning, that's when I start looking at uh, what the sectors are doing. Uh, and you can just do that. I do that straight off of the home page. I just go to that sector summary and I start looking at, you know, which ones are doing the best. That gives me an idea of where I might want to go if I feel like the market is looking good from, you know, previously. Does it, does it look good from the afternoon before? Am I going to be interested in, in trading? In general, like Tom said, we do have different systems, I guess you could say, mainly just because our trading horizons are different. And so, you know, I'll present a lot of things on Market Watchers uh, that I feel are good short term and intermediate term. Uh, those are the kinds of things I'm looking for because I don't sit in front of my computer completely all during the trading day. I just, um, I don't. That's my preference. Uh, so anyway, I, that's, that way I, I really do focus more on the intermediate term. So I do my sector analysis. I see which ones are doing well. I also like to go down uh, and look at the candle glance. I have my candle glance set up for the things that I like to look for being the PMO, the 20 and 50 and 200 day EMAs. Uh, that tells me overall what, what the look is for the sectors. And then finally, if you come back here, you can also do the sector RRG. And with Julius on the show regularly, I've really come to appreciate these. Interesting to see all four of these that are weakening are defensive sectors. So I think that is very interesting when you're looking at that for the intermediate term and you're improving our XLK and XLF. So technology and financials, all of those are more aggressive. So that's something interesting to consider, you know, if you're going to get ready to, you know, make any kind of uh, trading changes. I also do a review of my portfolio uh, on my, uh, the website where I, uh, invest. So <clears throat> I do my portfolio review there and see if everything is lining up the way I want and go check those charts. 
And then finally, uh, I, I do, because I am more intermediate term, I check, uh, I have a weekly checklist as well. And part of that, uh, I do the, my checklist on Wednesday and Friday. On Wednesdays, because I'm writing that DP alert article, I go through all of those indicators that I just showed you. That's Carl's DP weekly wrap. That's on Fridays, a must, must read. Uh, and then I do DP alerts on Wednesday. And so I will look at, in order to prepare the DP alert, I have to look at what the, the scoreboards are doing. That's part of my daily. The sector scoreboard, I take a peek at that so I know where our uh, signals are. Uh, notice here in the long term, the long term buy signals are all in the defensive sectors. Since I am an intermediate to long term trader, that's why uh, right now I am invested in uh, XLU, uh, XLP, but I'm looking at XLY as well. And let's see. Uh, so the thing with uh, the PMO and those the signal table here, the PMO signals are not derived simply from the daily chart. Uh, like the trend model. The trend model signals are all based on EMA crossovers. The PMO signals are based on the daily chart PMO, the weekly chart PMO, and the monthly chart PMO. So every week I have to make sure that I don't have any uh, intermediate term PMO signal changes because I update those on these scoreboards. But I also look as far as my portfolio, where, what the PMO is doing in the uh, on the weekly chart, uh, those types of things. So the intermediate term PMOs would be my next uh, weekly uh, check. But like I said, I have to do the Wednesday and the Friday. Uh, I'm looking at these charts and I do update them and you can read uh, about what I'm thinking of uh, what's going on. And then finally, the last thing I would say would be the sentiment. And I prepare that for all of you uh, every, um, let's see, I usually present it on Mondays. So every Monday afternoon on Market Watchers, I'll give you the sentiment report and the sentiment, uh, you know, you'll get your, you'll get all of the polls. I'll tell you what you should think about it, but that's my weekly checklist as well. So just to sort of summarize mine and we'll look at a summary slide later but uh, so every day in the afternoon i start my prep and that is by looking at my close of business indicators i then will go into my live chart list uh, or the dp chart gallery is where you could go as well to look at what's happening with the scoreboard indexes look for signal changes uh, check my do the sector and portfolio review in the morning and then weekly, I do check my, you know, my chart lists and make sure that I don't have any new PMO signals on weekly charts. And I check the sentiment. And, you know, of course, monthly, I also have to check the charts at the end of the month, which is going to be coming up here soon to see if I have any signal changes there as far as the long term PMOs go. And uh, let's see, I want to show you the chart that is important at the end of the month. And that is my S&P 500 one. And this is why currently I'm still uh, in, in bear market mode. Now, I have to say, you can see we are starting to finally get a little bit of deceleration on this sell signal. And if I see even more deceleration by the end of the month, that will tell me that, OK, um, time to reevaluate. Are we looking at the end of this uh, secular bear market? I still think we're in for a bit more uh, downside uh, like we saw previously, but uh, I'll have to reevaluate if the monthly PMO starts to turn around. So that would be one of the monthly charts I look at for sure. And just uh, uh, to reiterate before I pass it on to Tom, is you know every Wednesday you'll be able to to go through the DP alert and I go through all of those indicators. It's the same charts so that and I find it very helpful as Carl does with Friday is we show you those same charts and we show you those changes and we write about them and you're going to be able to look at them yourself now and analyze them without our help all the time because you're going to see them every day and you're going to see what we look for and what we're seeing and you'll learn from that.
And so I, I think it's important to add to your weekly and uh, weekly checklist to go check out the DP alert on Wednesdays and the uh, DP weekly wrap on Fridays. All right, Tom, I know you're going to dive into, you know, trading morning and boom, what do you do? All right. Well, I definitely take a more of a short term approach. Um, so I am looking to trade, you know, pretty frequently. Um, there are a number of things that uh, kind of grab my attention. So I'm going to go through first and just talk a little bit of how I set things up for the trading day. So when you look at um, uh, my dashboard and I, I deliberately got rid of everything. So really there's, this is bare minimum. So I'm going to show you how I set things up just so that I have as much information at my, as, at my disposal when I start in the morning as possible. So the first thing I would do is if you're a member here at stock charts, you have this little gear uh, over here in the upper right hand corner. And if you click on that, you have options. And so first thing I would do is add additional data panels because I want more information. Uh, scanning and uh, setting up your alerts. I'm not in, really into the alerts because I follow the market so closely, but I certainly would understand if you use the alerts, it's a valuable feature here. And then finally, uh, chart list panels. And I would click on update. So let's talk a little bit about what shows up here. So right here on the on this first data panel here, I like to use the market movers and it sometimes it varies, but normally I have the top 10 most active on the S&P Sometimes I'll take a quick look at what's leading. So you can see right there, Garmin, uh, Devon Energy. Um, I think that's Choice. Is that Choice or Host? That's Host Hotels. Um, HST, so you got a hotel leading. And you can go right down the list and get a sense of what's leading the market. You also can get a quick sense as to what is not leading the market and what is lagging. And you can see CVS with its earnings, CXO with its earnings, um, Love with a downgrade. Uh, take two electronic arts. These two stocks uh, really were part of that group that was getting beaten down in uh, earlier in February um, and so forth. So you just have a quick uh, point of reference as to what's going on in the market. So I like having that market movers chart panel. Now, this additional row of uh, panels I use for scooters. I mean, you can do you can, you know, bring up a top 10. You can have the Dow. You can have the S&P, New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ. You can go into Canada. You got London. You got a lot of different choices here. You can get into the scooters. You could pull up the ticker cloud. This tells you what every all the other users at Stock Charts are interested in. So folks uh, that are looking at a, you know, if there's one symbol that the majority of people at Stock Charts are looking at. It's going to show up here in big letters. So you can see Apple and Amazon and Netflix and NVIDIA. But sometimes, and then you can see Garmin, GRMN. So if you didn't know earnings were out, you might look at this and say, oh, I wonder what's going on with that stock. Um, KNDI, I believe this is the uh, top performer in the NASDAQ today. If you didn't know it, KNDI, look at the stock, up 44%. How would you know? Well, there's a lot of different ways, but one would be the ticker cloud. So there's a lot of different reasons why you could use, you know, these different um, uh, set or, you know, different panels. But I like to keep it on scooters. It's just my personal uh, favorite. I use the large cap. Uh, normally, what I do is I look at the top up. So I have large cap, and then I have the mid cap, top up, and then I go with small cap. And it's just telling me which ones are moving. Um, you know, so Garmin, for instance, is up 20.6 today to 99.4. And if you look at the top 10, by the way, Garmin has now made its way up to number four on the list of large cap stocks. So it is among the best stocks out there in terms of scooter rank. So that's my next level. So I can quickly see what's going on in the market. As soon as the market opens and prices start to change, so too do their scooters. And so having the scooter analysis up provides uh, just a quick sense of, you know, some stocks that I might want to take a look at, um, especially if I'm looking for something outside of my chart lists. The next one is the chart lists. And I have my strong earnings chart list and I have my weak earnings chart list, but I'm not really shorting. So right now that's just in it for color, just to kind of keep, uh, you know, make everything look kind of balanced. Um, but I, I'm just not really looking to short stocks. So right now I'm looking on the long side. Although another thing that I consider when I get ready for the trading day is what time of the calendar month we are in. And you might say, well, what the heck? 
what does that have to do with anything? Well, I'm going to tell you what the heck it has to do with, because we're going to take a look. Uh, well, we're not. I don't have the my Excel on this computer, but I'm going to read off to you some just a couple of interesting facts about the stock market, the S&P 500. You can break the S&P 500 down into four periods of a calendar month. The 26th to the 6th is the most bullish time to be long stocks. There's an annualized return during that period of 20.73%. Um, now, keep in mind that the S&P since 1950 has only gone up an average of 9%. So the 26th to the 6th is producing annualized returns that are more than double what you get on the S&P throughout the entire year, essentially. So I think that's really important. Now, you might look at that initially and say, well, it's only 11 trading days, you know, 26th to the 6th. But that's 11 trading days of every month since 1950. That's a third, a little bit more than a third of the trading days since 1950. And the chance of the market going up any particular day throughout the year is 53.5%. That's how many times... You know, when you look back since 1950, the S&P 500 has gone up 53.5% of the days, and it's gone down 46.5% of the days. Well, from the 26th to the 6th, that 53.5% jumps up to almost 56%. Um, statistically, that's relevant. I mean, you've got a much better chance the market's going to go higher, and the annualized returns are significant. So a lot of times my buying, when I start to buy, it's more you know, toward the end of this week or into early next week from a seasonal perspective, historical perspective, I know that money is going to be coming into the market at first of the month. And I know those who are anticipating that money coming in are going to start buying before it gets here. So 26 to the 6th, you should keep in mind as the best time to be in the stock market, especially if you're looking at it from a short-term trading perspective. The 7th to the 10th, has produced annualized return of minus 5.78%. The 11th to the 18th, it's kind of like a rinse and repeat on that bullish earlier bullish cycle because money tends to come in middle of the month as well. 11th to the 18th, uh, annualized return of 13.75%. And the 19th to the 25th, today's the 20th, by the way, 19th to the 25th, 8.88%, minus 8.88%. So um, I've actually been cashing out some trades because I do think, you know, as I pointed out, we're getting close to overhead resistance. The market has a tendency to come down this time of the of the uh, calendar month. And I had some nice profits on the big gains that we've seen recently. So I actually have been moving more into cash and hoping that we do get a little bit of a short term pullback. Uh, but that's the historical slant to it. Now, from an actual chart perspective, um, here's my strong earnings chart list. Now, one of the things I like to do, and I don't like to buy this time of the, the month, so I'm kind of waiting, but uh, when I look at my strong earnings chart list, I don't like to buy the stocks that are up 5% or 3% already today, especially if I would think the market's overbought and we might get a pullback. If I'm going to buy, I want to look to the stocks that are getting hit the worst, you know, getting hit the hardest to the downside. Every one of the stocks on this strong earnings chart list beat recent Wall Street estimates in terms of quarterly revenues and quarterly earnings per share. They also, in my opinion, look good, pretty, pretty good anyway, technically on their charts. So I actually like to look at the stocks on this list as they pull back. And Love is one that actually has my attention. Southwest Airlines, LUV. All of my stocks, I have quick annotations. I'm looking at some key areas. Here was the gap up in January with earnings. Um, we got up to 58, 59. Look, we were way overbought. I don't like to buy back in here. But when we start pulling back and getting close to key support levels, this is where I can manage my risk to the downside. So, yeah, Southwest Airlines, the fact that it's pulling back, I'm going to be looking at a stock like this early in the trading day. And normally, I'm going to pull the trigger. Today, I haven't pulled the trigger. And again, it's mostly because of the bias to want to stick to cash and not want to buy during a period where the market tends to sell off. I think I might be able to get this one a little bit cheaper, maybe another dollar lower, maybe even down to the tail. Uh, because when you gap up and you start selling off, I could actually draw uh, another line uh, or maybe move this top line down to the bottom of this tail, which is about 52.75. I wouldn't be shocked to see Love get as low as that. That's 
cheaper than where it is right now. Now, keeping in mind, my target's all the way back up here, up here near the recent highs. So 58, 58 and a half would be a good target for me on Southwest Airlines. And buying it back down around 53 and a half, 54, I can really set up my reward to risk uh, strongly because I'll have $5 to the top and I probably only have to give away a dollar to the downside. If I can set up five to one reward to risk ratios, I only have to hit one out of five to break even. And if I happen to hit two out of five, I'm gonna make good money. If I hit three out of five or four out of five, you can imagine uh, the profits that you're gonna get from that. So that's how you know I set up and try to use the uh, this dashboard. So, but again, it's really simple. Just make sure that you have your, you know, that you check the gears up here and just put whatever panels that you want down below so that you can quickly get to potential trades. Now, the last thing I'll mention here is under the scans, you got your scans. Here's the alerts. As I said, I don't use the alerts. I think it's a fantastic feature, but I'm so active every day looking at the market. I just don't think I need it. Um, I probably could still use it. But anyway, we'll talk, that'll be a discussion for another day. Um, but the scans are really important. I'm going to show you a high volume scan that I use. And usually I call it my 10 a.m. high volume because I usually use it at about 10 o'clock Eastern, about a half hour after the market opens. Normally what I'll do is if I just want to see what's going on in all U.S. stocks, you can see my filter here is U.S. stocks. And you can see up here under the criteria that I'm looking only at U.S. stocks. Um, the key here is the daily volume. So what I'm looking for are stocks that are showing unusually heavy volume. In the first half hour, if I run this at 10 a.m. and stocks have already hit 40% of their normal daily volume in the first 30 minutes of trading, <clears throat> that might be a stock I wanna take a look at. Now I can further filter this out to only look at my strong earnings chart list. So if I want to see, whoops, not the weak one, the strong one. So if I want to see stocks in my strong earnings chart list that all of a sudden have really strong volume, I can put that in as a filter. Now I'm way past 10 a.m. So if I go right now, we're halfway through the day, a lot of the stocks are going to show up if I use a multiplier of 0.4. So what I would do is just say, all right, I'm halfway through the day. I'd be interested if there are any stocks on my list that are already doing their average volume halfway through the day. And if I update my criteria, now you can see that this is switched. It's no longer 40%, but now it's 100% of my daily uh, simple moving average of, of daily volume. And then here you can see my strong earnings chart list. <clears throat> All right. So now I'm going to run the scan and just see what comes up. Well, this tells me three stocks. Well, look at here. I've got love on my list. Stock is uh, getting hit. Scooter only 23. So it's not one of the best stocks out there. Another reason you want to make sure you're, you're, you have your stop in play in the event it doesn't uh, pan out, but it is on this list of high volume. Now, two others, CPT, I can tell you we're getting a breakout or we just got a breakout recently on this one. It's coming down, nice little test on its 20-day moving average. This is a pretty um, bullish development on this stock, in my opinion. Pulled back, went below the 20-day heavy volume, and now we're back up above the 20-day. I think this one's got a good chance to maybe rally back up that 99 or even maybe 100 level. All right, let's take a look at uh, what was the other one? Uh, TNET. Okay, TNET. Uh, big gap up. I think we're just getting a little flag here. Yes, the volume's heavy, but it's heavy because there's been so much interest the last couple of days. Uh, this actually looks a lot like the Garmin candle we talked about earlier. Look at the volume and the huge move up. If this stock would ever work its way back down to just below 56, I would be interested, no doubt. Uh, for now, I'm just going to kind of watch it. <clears throat> I'm not going to force trades, especially on uh, the 20th of the month. I'm not going to force trades. I know that this time of the month historically is not a great time. All right, so essentially for me, again, it's just about getting back to, um, you know, having things set up so that I can quickly get to what I need, um, having a, a discipline, and your discipline could be a lot different than mine. It can be a lot different than Aaron's, but I do think that getting into a discipline of finding the types of 
stocks that you trade or that you invest in for the longer term. I think it all comes down to having a process and then com- just you know continually trying to uh, tweak uh, that process. But hopefully that gives you a little bit of indication um, as to you know Aaron's approach, my approach, and the way we use these things. One last thing before we get into the summary, I do want to just show you the um, in my article today. Um, I did do a um, webinar with John Hopkins at Earnings Beach yesterday. And in my article from today, if you have any interest in that chart list that I just showed you, um, they have a special at Earnings Beach right now. For the next 90 days, they will send it to Stock Charts members. You have to be a Stock Charts member in order to download a chart list at Stock Charts. So you have to be at least an extra member. But if you go into this uh, special note area of my blog this morning, you could come in here and click and get the um, take their service out for 90 days. Um, I helped um, develop the service. So obviously I'm very biased, but I think that it works. I, I like trading stocks that only beat Wall Street estimates. I think that uh, Wall Street has more confidence in these companies when they sell off. I think they're the first ones to get bought back. Um, but anyhow, you can check this out if you want. I'm pretty certain, too, that, John, if you uh, if you sign up, we'll send you a recording of the webinar from last night. I did give out my top 10 picks for the next quarter. And I can tell you that when you go into the dashboard here, under the best performing stocks, uh, let's see there. FLDM is on my top 10 list. You can see it's the best performer in the list today. It's up 5%. But of this group, uh, there are three of them on the top 10 here that are on my top 10. Let's see, four. I'll, give, I'll tell you, INFY is on my list. So four of the top 11 stocks today were in my top 10 from this chart list. So if you want to go in and take a look at that, uh, you can follow the link on my blog article. All right, so uh, hopefully that helped everybody. Give us, give everyone, especially if you're new to the show, a little bit of insight as to how Aaron and I approach the market. We're definitely different, but that can be a good thing. All right. Well, it makes the show a little more interesting, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, if we both did the same thing, it would be very redundant. Absolutely. So yeah. there you go. I, I do want to add, though, I mean, if you're interested in how I like actually pick a trade, I did a, a workshop on uh, the life cycle of a decision point trade that is probably floating around on YouTube somewhere. So, Awesome. Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, we are going to jump now into the 10 in 10. It's always a fun segment. All righty. What do we got for today? All right. I do have the RRG up and going here. And, you know, lots, I always find it interesting. Um, A lot of you pick these ones going in that northeast direction. And as Julia says, those are the ones that you do want to look at. So I'll try and pull a few of those. And then I thought it was, I always find it interesting to look at what sectors have been requested and look at technology, not a whole lot. Um, Usually technology will, you know, really, um, be the big one on the big sector on this RRG. Uh, only one consumer staple. So consumer discretionary is still up there. Uh, we always get a lot of those as well. So anyway, let's go ahead and get started. I don't know if you are a Monty Python follower, Tom, but our first symbol is knee, something that the knights, <laughs> <laughs> the knights that go knee. Do you remember that now? Okay. <laughs> Yes, I do. I do remember. Don't make me laugh. I'm trying to do the 10 and 10. Gosh, Monty Python. That was hilarious. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and jump in and take a look at NEE. Um, NEE. Well, the first thing I'm going to say is it's a defensive stock. It's more defensive oriented. So for those who want to be involved in the market, but don't really want to jump on board some of these stocks that have just been crazy to the upside, have tremendous growth rates and, and so forth then I think this one could make sense. Um, I pulled it up on my relative um, charts. So you could just see here's the stock price breaking out to new highs. That's good. Market hasn't done that yet. You can see that's peer group also getting close to a breakout. So the fact that NEE has already broken out tells you you got a pretty good relative performer versus its peers. 
You also can see that it is performing well versus the S&P, even though it's a defensive area and defensive stock. It has held its own. Now, it has pulled back over the past two months while the market has been flying to the upside. But it, too, has been going up. It's not like it hasn't been going up. It just hasn't been going up as fast as the S&P 500. So you are losing a little bit. But it looks to me like it might be rounding and starting to turn back to the upside. And then, of course, it's peers relative to the S&P 500 have been rising over the last year, too. So this is a stock. Yes, it's defensive. Yes, it's probably not going to, you know, fly to the upside. So for those of you who are looking for big returns, uh, NEE probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But again, for those of you who are interested in a, in a leading stock in a more defensive area of the market, you want to maybe diversify a little bit. I think me looks really interesting in a, the, the directional lines that I've given you here. Uh, help to explain that hopefully all righty the most popular in the chat room right now is uh mrk of course merc all right was that on monty python no not that one <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, another one that's fairly defensive it's in the pharma and you can see outside of just recently this is another one that this is a group that has struggled in the past uh, two months, let's say, since we, we uh, bottomed back in December in the market. But overall, this has been a pretty good defensive performer. And once again, yes, it's underperforming in 2019, but it's not losing money. It just hasn't gone up as fast as the rest of the market. So if you're concerned because we've gone so far, I'm going to do the exact same thing with this one that I just did with uh, knee. I think that you've got a, a stock, very strong, looks solid relative uh, or the uh, absolute performance of its peer group has been higher, starting to strengthen again. It had a really rough December, but it has begun to strengthen again, which I like. Merck, relative to the pharmas, you got one of the best stocks, which is always a good thing. And that's enabled it to outperform the S&P 500. We're starting to see some relative outperformance again. And then overall, again, 2019 been a little rough, especially the month of January, first three or four weeks of January. But it has stabilized, and this is a defensive area that could do well on a relative basis if the market does roll over. All right. Let's see. Our only consumer staple, Walmart. Yeah, you know, I meant to go back and take a look. I don't, do you know if they were downgraded when you? Uh, you no, no. No? Not today, maybe uh, earlier. Yeah, I mean, it, I didn't like yesterday's candle. I mean, it's coming off an uptrend. That's a gap up in a shooting star. That normally, uh, you normally see at least short-term weakness after that. Um, I do like Walmart um, as it gets down closer to the 20-day. I'm going to like it even more. I do like the fact, I, I'm pretty sure they beat on both top and bottom line. I'm looking down here at the relative charts. Everything's okay. I mean, the group itself um, is just kind of going along for the ride with the S&P, not really outperforming. But Walmart is an outperformer versus the S&P, and it is an outperformer versus its peers. And the group has begun to strengthen here of late. So there are some, some real positives here. But I, I think, again, for me on Walmart, it's probably just going to come down to it getting to a key area of support that I like. Uh, I would look at the rising 20-day moving average. I think it's going to find support there if it gets there. And that would be down at 97.33 right now. All righty. Next one up, let's look at U.S. Steel in the materials area, of course, X. Okay, well, materials the last couple of days have been doing uh, much better, um, but this is not one of the best stocks within the group. Uh, here you can see steel stocks rallying this year, but look at uh, X relative to the steel group and look at steel relative to the S&P. It's shown a little bit of strength, but I think the overall downtrend continues here. So you've got a group that's been downtrending relative to the S&P, a stock downtrending relative to the S&P. Same thing, the stock relative to its peers. So you got a fairly weak group and a very weak stock within the group. Uh, I'm not interested. Yes, it's up today. Uh, you've got a lot of overhead resistance. I just am not going to try to outperform the stock market. I'm not going to try and outperform the benchmark S&P 500 with a stock that's underperforming a group that's underperforming the S&P 500. It just doesn't make any sense. So I think the key here in the short term is let's watch that big gap down that it had back in uh, November right here. See that big gap down? Look at the volume. Um, until we can get back through, that was a prior support level too at 25. So we gapped below that support on big volume and sold off. We still have not even gotten back to this 
uh, breakdown, let alone the October, November highs. And forget about the earlier highs in 2018. We've got a lot of work to do here. I'm not a fan. I would look elsewhere. All righty. Let's see the next one. Uh, iShares Silver Trust, SLV. We talk a lot about gold. What do you think is silver? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, gold and silver both are acting much better. I'm, I'm still concerned longer term. And let me go ahead and pull up a chart here on the SLV. And uh, maybe we can take a look at the weekly chart. Um, yeah, I mean, the overall downtrend here, I think, is still in play longer term. Short term, and I've talked about this, I think gold and silver broken out. You can short term trade them on the long side. I would just be aware of the longer term downtrend that we've had here and not just um, the last three years, but I'll just go back the last decade and show what's been going on. I mean, this is a long term downtrend with the exception of the first half of 2016. When could you really be in silver and help to outperform the S&P 500? Very difficult to find times. So, yes, short term, we're starting to see a little bit of strength. That's great. I think we still got a lot of issues with this longer term chart. So what I've said all along is if this stock breaks below um, its rising 20 week moving average, just keep in mind the long term trend is lower. So I would not be a fan if all of a sudden we started seeing breakdowns of short term moving average. Notice what happened here. We held that 20 heading higher. But once we rolled over, that was it for the highs. So that's what I'd be looking for. I'm short term bullish, but make sure you understand short term. If this thing turns back to the downside, keep in mind the dollar is in a seven year uptrend, in my opinion, eight year uptrend, really. And so if that resumes, then I think it's going to be very difficult to make money in gold and silver. All right. Excellent. I think you've heard of this next one, uh, Netflix. Yeah, I think I have heard of that. That's part of uh, what do they call it? The Fang uh, Internet. Internet. It's in the new comm services sector. Yeah. Um, a beautiful move up back in uh, January. It came back very quickly and got close to those October highs. Did something that most other stocks were not doing. And you can see we have been continuing to hold the rising 20 day moving average. So for me, this one's easy. I like it. Uh, just be careful if it falls back below these moving averages, especially if the overall market were to fall back below the 20 as well. I think that combination, you could see selling begin to escalate in a stock like Netflix. But until I see that, based on what I'm seeing here, I think we're gonna make a run for those highs that we saw back uh, in 2018. So 380, 390, I think could easily be in the cards here for Netflix as we go forward, but watch that rising 20 day. All right, a specialty retailer for you, overstock.com, O-S-T-K. All right, O-S-T-K. Um, nice volume here recently, and we're breaking out. This is, you know, after trending lower, hopefully you can kind of look at this 20-day moving average and see, for the most part, that's where overstock struggled on the way down. It couldn't sustain a move through the 20. Look at what's happening now. You see the change of character in the chart, the way things are developing here. I'm going to stretch this out and see if we can get a good solid trend line to maybe uh, highlight this a little better. Well, that gap up there, let's go back a couple years. You definitely can see the volume, though, coming in here to the upside. And let's go ahead and hit this downtrend line. And we could do, I mean, this channel that it's been in recently is something like that. Um, see that channel that it's been, it was in for four or five months straight down. Well, of course, it's not going to stay in that channel because if it did in four months, we'd be at zero. Uh, probably, and most stocks are not going to do that. So when you get a stock that's sloping this rapidly, either up to, to the upside or downside, they're going to break. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the long-term downtrend is over. But I do really like what's going on in terms of the volume coming in here on Overstock as it makes these moves up and it continues to trade above that uh, rising 20 day moving average. But there's that volume. And I am a big volume person. I, I think it's important because institutions can't accumulate without volume. Uh, but here is the volume showing you that things are really starting to pick up. And if you look back when, the, when we broke out here, September, October, November, you can kind of see the volume really picking up before we made a huge run to the upside. So 
definitely have to look at this and, and see a lot more bullish developments taking place. Um, so I would be a fan just waiting on a pullback, maybe closer to that 20 day. All right. The next one is going to be Fabrinet. And I was like, God, that sounds really familiar. That's because it was a Monday setup for me yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> I, I actually... wish I picked it. <laughs> What's that? And I wish I picked it. Well, I actually sold it today. Actually, I own this one. This is on my strong earnings chart list. And you can see it coming down here. Actually, I think if I let me pull up my strong earnings chart list, I'll show you the annotations that are on it. It went right down, hit support and then came back up, got close to resistance. And again, because it's February 20th, I didn't want to take any chances. Let me see if I can find it here on the list. There it is. Oh, that's interesting. Yep. So there it was. Came right down, hit that support perfectly at 51. It's kind of like gap support, these prior highs. Um, not really anything prior to that, but this was a, the first area of support I was watching. And then, of course, the biggest area on, on the chart, as far as I'm concerned, be all the way down here. But that reversal, when we went below support and came back up above it and it held, I thought that was a very bullish sign. And then short term, it's made this move up. But if I drew another line in, it would be resistance at 58. I'm a dollar away. And if this stock just simply consolidates like it's been doing, then I think you've got a, a potential issue with the stock going back down. And so I don't want to look a profit uh, like this and just watch it evaporate. So it could break out. I agree with you, Aaron. I think that the, the in this case, the PPO, and I know your PMO was looking much better, but I am a price resistance support kind of a, a, kind of a trader. Mm -hmm. And I, I honor these resistance levels until they break out. So I think it's getting close to a short-term sell, and let's see if it can get that breakout. If it breaks out, then all of a sudden that resistance becomes support, and I may be buying back in somewhere down the road. But for now, for me, it was a short-term sell. And I will go ahead and save this as a 10 and 10. Uh, let's see. So our next one is a bank, uh, Popular Incorporated, and it's BPOP. All right, Bebop. Yeah, Bebop, Bebop. <laughs> <laughs> um, right at resistance. I mean, I, this is another one that if it were me, I would be selling. It's got a negative divergence, and it's hitting overhead resistance. That is just beating me over, over the head. But that, that's the area. That's where it opened. That's where it got to. That's where the buyers, that's where short sellers got control, market makers probably, got control and came back down. And look at this as it made this breakout and reversed. It had a negative divergence. So that, well, technically it didn't. Well, actually, yes, it did. Let me show you. I'm, I'm confusing myself. Um, in order to get a negative divergence, because the uh, PPO, MACD, all of these momentum oscillators generally are based on closing prices, you need to have a higher close. And we actually had that the day before the, the reversal. So you had higher prices, lower PPO, reversing candle. Look what happened after it. Now let's uh, fast forward, higher prices, we're hitting resistance, and right now we have a negative divergence. Now it is entirely possible that stock keeps going up and the negative divergence evaporates, is eliminated as the PPO moves higher. But if I'm trying to be cautious, especially again, February 20th, I know the market tends to struggle this time of the month. I think this is a stock that I would be looking at taking profits if I owned it. All right. And our final one is going to be FXI. That's the large cap China ETF. Um, I'm sorry, FXI? FXI. Okay. Um, let's stretch out the chart here. It looks to me like we're up against some resistance here as well. Uh, yeah, it would be bullish globally for the market to break out here. The two key areas of resistance, it looks to me like we're testing the first one. So this was a prior low before the breakdown in June. And then here was the reaction high on the, after the breakdown. So we hadn't been able to get back through about 43.80. And then prior, we had broken down around 44.40. So I think this is the area where we want to be um, cognizant of the overhead resistance. And just like I showed a second ago, Right now, we have a little bit of a negative divergence on the chart that you should at least be aware of. So I don't know that it turns back around to the downside, but I would be a little cautious here as we hit this uh, key area of overhead resistance. 
All righty, and that does conclude the 10 and 10. Here are the symbols that we just went over, and you will find those in the Market Watchers Live chart list. Just go to the Market Watchers Live blog, click on it, and the link will be right there at the top, as well as in all of the Market Watchers Live recaps. And now it is time for our final market update. All righty, and here we go. Uh, markets have pulled back. You know, we were looking at positive, uh, you know, movement across the board, but now we can see that the Dow is still positive, but the S&P 500, the NASDAQ have both fallen into negative territory. Mid caps and small caps are hanging in there. Uh, they are pulling back. Russell 2000 nearly uh, reaching toward yesterday's close. See if it can stay in the positive. Uh, Canadian markets looking a little bit more healthy, up almost 65 points for the TSX. Treasury yields were rising earlier today, but they are now falling yet again. 2.641% uh, is the current reading. The VIX was falling, but it is starting to make a rise, uh, still under 15, reading at 1462. UP is down a bit after starting the day uh, higher on the day. Gold is making a nice uh, run to the upside, slowly hasn't pulled back, uh, doesn't seem to be too concerned about what's going on with the dollar at this point. USO, a uh, nice big move uh, earlier this morning and now consolidating that move sideways. Currently, USO is up 20 cents at $11.98. And TLT, big drop, continuing a declining trend, but it looks like we might be pulling out of that on TLT but we are still down under $122 at $121.96. And then just a quick peek, I thought I would show you the sector summary right here. And currently, as you can see, materials sector is just flying high at 1.75% to the upside. Uh, middle of the road is consumer discretionary, not going really anywhere. And real estate and healthcare, both defensive sectors uh, performing poorly on the day down over uh, half a percent. That's all I have for you, Tom. And what do you got for us before we get started on our final segment? Okay, well, one of the areas of materials that you just pointed out is the specialty chemicals index. And this is an index that you can see over the past uh, six, eight weeks, really been uh, performing pretty well. And uh, the, the materials, the leadership in materials, I think, at least in part, uh, we're seeing is due to the falling dollar. And so as the dollar weekends, material stocks have been certainly leading the way here this week. And this is one of the areas of uh, the materials that have been performing well. So I just wanted to point that out. This is a group that has been strengthening, looks pretty good technically on this daily chart. And it also is a pretty good lead in to our next segment, which is uh, what would you do? Um, and in this segment, we have actually um, kind of allowed everyone out there to participate with us because in the poll today, we asked about five stocks that have been breaking out and wh what you would do, whether or not you would buy them technically. And Aaron and I are going to take a quick look at each of them. Uh, I don't know. We probably have a minute each for each one of these five stocks. And we're going to come up with whether we would be a buyer, a seller, or whether it would just be a hold for us. So we're going to have to come up with something on these stocks. The first one is in this specialty chemical space. And I'll go ahead and start if that's all right, Aaron. Absolutely. Um, also, I'll do the first one. Let's do NGVT, which, and I'm going to bring it up on my relative chart. Um, I'll be very quick on this one. I'm a buyer. I like the sideways, sideways consolidation, uh, the breakout. I mean, yeah, technically, could you wait for a pullback to get in? Sure. But I think the stock goes higher. So if I've got to say buy, hold, or sell, I think I would be a buyer. I really like the stock with the, with the earnings coming out. Heavy volume coming in, breaking out. You can see clear relative strength in NGVT versus the specialty uh, chemical index. And you can see relative to the S&P, it just broke out. And the overall group is beginning to strengthen. Look at that relative breakout. We're at about a three-month high uh, with the action we're seeing today. So I think all in all, you got a good space and a good stock. So I say buy NGVT. What do you have? All righty. Um my opinion is I, I would have liked to, I'd like to be holding it. I wouldn't buy it right now, but if I were, uh, if I had it, I would continue to hold it. 
but I'm looking at a couple of problems here. You, the reason I wouldn't be a buyer, we have really overbought readings on the PMO at this point. And what I see is uh, really a parabolic type of a move. So if I had this, I would be holding it, but I would use a trailing stop on this one just because it looks like it could make a, you know, continue to make a great run to the upside. Uh, in fact, let me see if I can find that weekly chart. It still looks pretty good because you do have a weekly PMO that's on a buy signal and doing well. So I would be uh, holding it with a trailing stop. All right. Well, well, why don't you go ahead and take the next one? This is a defensive stock. Kimberly Clark, KMB. What do you think there? All right. I like it. And I think you were talking about this one earlier and how you liked it as well. Uh, honestly, now that I'm looking at it even closer, we got that pullback toward that support level at 118. So this is looking extremely attractive to me. Uh, let me show you a few things of why I like it. And first of all, like I said, is this breakout right here. And I'm going to put it down to 118 because that's uh, a little bit above that. Actually, we could do that is where we saw the high uh, back in December. Um, but really, I would I'd say muscle memory as far as investors are probably looking at the 118 level. And currently, we're still holding that. I like it, like I said, because we got that move to the upside and we are pulling back. I think you could uh, look at this as uh, not a double bottom. I think a lot of people might look at that, uh, but double bottoms are reversal patterns. What I would be noticing is that when we came up here on that rally, we formed a double top. And when we came down, we did not execute it. Instead, we moved to the upside. A bullish uh, outcome to a bearish pattern is especially bullish. So uh, on Kimberly Clark, I would be a buyer on this one. I think this is really lined up nicely. And even a look at the weekly chart will show you the importance of that breakout. It comes all the way back here to beat these 2017 uh, highs we saw back there. And then I think the upside potential is looking really good. And it's in that sector, the staple sector that I like. All right. Um, I've got mixed feelings on this one, uh, on KMB, but I'm going to go with the sell. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that uh, there are some, some positives here on the stock. Um, but when I look back over the last three years of a bull market, the stock's done nothing. I mean, on a relative basis. So yes, if you want to protect against the downside, maybe this is an okay play. And I even wrote about this stock earlier and I didn't look at the weekly chart. I didn't look at my relative chart uh, when I wrote it, uh, talked about Kimberly Clark earlier today. It is make, if it can get back up to 120 and I'm saying if, then I, I would maybe begin to think short term, it could have a little bit more, more run to the upside. When I look at the daily chart, one problem I had is on the breakout, the volume is just kind of moderate. It's okay, it's not great. Um, and when I pull up the relative chart, and this is where I really had the problem with this stock, is that you've got a very, very strong um, industry group that's already broken out to new highs. And when you look at Kimberly Clark relative to its peers, it's not been performing well. So I think there are probably better options in the space than Kimberly Clark. And you can see that over the past two months, this has been a not a very good performer versus the uh, S&P 500. And the group, even though it's been very strong, has actually begun struggling uh, over the last eight weeks or so versus the S&P 500. So there are some things I like on this one, but if I had to do one, two, or three, I'm going to say sell and look for something else in this same space. Wow. Okay. That's right. interesting. Yeah. Um, I figured you'd probably like that. <laughs> uh, let's see here. The next one up is IPHI. Mm -hmm. And I believe this is a semiconductor. Uh, yes, it is. Indeed. All right. Now, this one, I'm a buyer. Now, yes, it's overbought. Um, so a hold would probably be appropriate as well. But I'm going to go with buy. And the reason I'm going with buy is semiconductors have started to move. IPHI has been one of the better stocks. It's made the breakouts. It's got great volume trends. I think there's some accumulation taking place. When the overall uh, semiconductor group kept putting new, you know, lower lows and lower uh, lows, lower highs in back at the uh, in the fourth quarter. You can see the stock for the most part kept holding its prior lows. So I think the relative strength was already there, and we're starting to see it again, as you can see right here, IPHI relative to the semis. Now the thing that really starts to get me going on this is that the semis finally, after a downtrend and some sideways relative action, we're starting to see leadership again from the semis, 
And with this being one of the better ones with lots of volume coming in, I'm going to go with a buy. What do you think? All righty. Let's see. I would have to say, let me get back here to where I need to be. All right. And I have on this one in B and Phi. All right. I think uh, the opportunity is gone to get in it. I think it's uh, likely over, but this is such a great performer. I could see uh, maybe getting in just to, to enjoy the, the uh, rally off of this breakout. But this really the signals came in back here for the PMO. Hey, huh? I'm, I'm not seeing your chart. Oh, well, that would help if I hit, hit that button right there. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. All right, and more copy. Uh, PMO buy signal came in at, uh, all the way back here in January. Then we got confirmation with these uh, IT and long-term trend model buy signals. And they've been in, in place. We're getting nice margins now on all of these EMAs. It's a strong stock, but I think the main run, the place to get in has passed. Uh, although if you want to play it on this breakout above 42, I could see how you might cho choose to do that. But I don't like this overbought PMO. It's hitting territory we haven't seen in a year. Um, but what I would say is I wouldn't be selling because again, I'm, I'm more of an intermediate term trader. And I do think there's still more upside potential. I just don't know that I would be getting into it right now because look at how important that breakout was. And the next area of overhead resistance, I'd say is sitting at 45, but there's certainly uh, potential to move even higher. Just personally for me, um, I wouldn't be getting in it. I would have uh, liked to have gotten in it earlier for sure. So right. I would be a hold on this one. All right. Number four coming up is going to be Keysight Technologies, K-E-Y-S. What do you think there? All right. And I was already peeking at this one. This has also just been a really nice performer. What I like uh, is just pretty much a straight up move here. I mean, look at it's it's uh, been hanging out above that five day EMA uh, for a couple months now. Uh, but again, I think the opportunity to get in has passed. I had the PMO buy signal here at the end of December. We even got a bull kiss. You can see back here where it came back down to the signal line and then was a fake out, started to move higher, got this breakout above 62.50. Um, you know, that that's the place to get in. You can also see that intermediate term trend model buy signal came in here earlier at the beginning, beginning of January. So again, for me, um, I, I wouldn't be getting in it. Uh, I would certainly be holding it. Uh, and re one of the reasons I wouldn't get in it is this really overbought PMO. Do not like that. It's it's just really, really overbought. And let's see. And here you can see even on the weekly chart, I think it looks pretty overbought. And, and really on the weekly chart, it has that parabolic sort of feel to it. Uh, so again, hold on, enjoy this profit, uh, the profits you're getting. Watch for that weekly PMO if you're looking at an intermediate term. Um, you know, investment, if you're holding it, look for uh, deceleration on the weekly PMO. And that would be your sign to uh, reevaluate, possibly get out. All right. I am going to say hold on KEYS. All right. We agree. Uh, yes, we agree on one here. Um, and for many of the same reasons you just pointed out, I mean, if you look back on the chart, anytime you get a weekly, P or excuse me, weekly RSI, that's above 75. I mean, when you look back here, August, September, that kind of coincided with the top. You get back to June, it coincided with the top. You get back to March, it coincided with the top. Over here in November of 2016, it coincided with the top. This is probably getting a little long in the tooth. One thing you will notice, though, is even though they were all getting close to tops, they consolidated and then they went higher. So this is the kind of stock that I would hold. I don't think that the run is over. I don't think we've seen the high. I think that what the market is telling us is that there, this is a company that's that's growing rapidly and probably is going to continue to to grow rapidly. Um, so I think that KEYS is a great stock, but it's a hold for me. It's just too overbought to even begin thinking about jumping in. And I think the history here shows that. All right, last one that we've got. I'll go ahead and start it, and you can wrap it up, Aaron. We're going to go right. with KMI, which is Kinder Morgan. And uh, I will tell you right now that I am a buyer. I would be a buyer. I am not a buyer, but I would be a buyer of KMI. And the reason for it, number one, 
Yes, it's been going up, and yes, on a daily basis, it is a little overbought, but this has been sideways consolidating for a while, and it finally just made this breakout around the 18 and a quarter area recently. So it's only at 19 and a quarter. I think it's got room to run to the upside. The other thing is if we pull it up on the relative chart, I think KMI, uh, first of all, it's broken the new highs above the highs that it saw back in October, whereas its industry group pipelines has not yet quite reached the highs that it set back in August. So the group has been very strong off of the December low. And you can see that KMI has been one of the best performers within the pipelines. So if I got a hot stock or a hot area of the market, and here's pipelines, by the way, relative to the S&P. So this is a group that's really been performing well, even though energy has struggled maybe a little bit on a, on a, re on a uh, relative basis, pipelines have been very strong. KMI is even stronger. And so for that reason, I would be a buyer. What do you think? All righty. Uh, you probably, you know, 45 seconds or so. Okay, easy. Uh, a hold. Uh, you know, again, I think that our opportunity to buy it has passed. Uh, so I, I wouldn't buy it just for that reason. And then looking at the weekly, uh, if I were holding it, I would continue to hold it. I think you do have some upside potential, at least to $20 possibly up here to challenge those tops. But again, I wouldn't want to get in because it is rather overbought. It's made a lot of its run. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. So that was fun. Yes, I like that. And there you go with our, uh, what we said. And, and uh, I only, I would be a buyer of only the Kimberly uh, Clark, which is funny. That is your only sell. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> no, I seriously like it. I might be, uh, uh, I might be going over to my account and going to put some of that. <laughs> well, it does kind of fit the the theme. I mean, if you're worried about the market hitting a top and pulling yeah. back, defensive stocks should should outperform. So if you want to be in the market, KMB makes sense. I just think based on its relative weakness among its peers that maybe there's some others out there better. That's all. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, uh, I get what your analysis is all about. And yes, I am, I am still feeling uh, tentative about the market. So tiptoeing in in these defensive sectors I like. Somebody did say, um, you know, the RRG is all those sectors are not moving the right direction. Why are you in them? Uh, because the charts look great. Mm -hmm. Well, it does come down to, to the charts, individual charts and how you read them, because um, you can have a group that's underperforming, but you can still have outperforming stocks within it. Mm -hmm. Plenty of those. I think it makes it tougher for sure, but um, it, it still happens. Yep. Okay, so among uh, everyone else out there, 46% um, uh, have gone with KMI, Kinder Morgan, as, their, as the buy. Hmm. Um, Keys and KMB, uh, close second. And then uh, IPHI and NGVT. You know, some of these stocks, too, were, they were fun because probably not too many of you out there are familiar with some of these stocks. I know I'm not. Uh, hmm. I knew a little bit about Keysight. Of course, we both know Kimberly Clark and Kinder Morgan. Mm -hmm. But... Infi Corp and Ingevity Corp, I was not that familiar with. Um, actually, NGVT, I think, might be on my strong earnings chart list, but uh, oh. still, not, not household names. All right. Well, I think it's interesting what, what people chose. I'm glad to see Kimberly Clark second, since that was mine. <laughs> yep. And, the, and you did make some good points about mar uh, many of those stocks being overbought, so maybe they're better holds than buys. Market's very overbought, too, so it's just hard not to find overbought stocks when the market's been so hot. Amen. All right. Well, that is another wrap. Uh, appreciate everybody being with us today. Please remember to complete the survey as you exit. Uh, it is located below your video player. Uh, we do love to get your feedback here, what you think. Let us know what you thought of our little segment about the, how we trade some of our preparations. Love to hear what you think there and give us some tips on what you do. Um, as a quick reminder, Market Watchers live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Wednesday afternoon, everybody. See you back here tomorrow. Happy trading.